ushers. Welcome to the house of the Lord. What a great day, what a beautiful day. Please stand with me as we read God's word. Uh, and I'm gonna do this again. I told the 9 a.m. They did pretty good. You guys got a challenge now. Uh, we're, I'm gonna keep doing this glory thing until the elders ask me to stop, or, or you guys, Donovan tells me it's stupid. So um, when I pray, we're gonna close it out and the church cries out and you will say, glory, like you wanna give God the glory he deserves at the top of your lungs. All right, Psalm 143. Lord, hear my prayer and your faithfulness. Listen to my plea. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I reflect on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. I am like parched land before you. Answer me quickly, Lord, my spirit fails. Don't hide your face from me. Let me experience your faithful love in the morning for I trust in you. Reveal to me the way I should go because I appeal to you. Teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Holy Father, Holy Spirit, come down, fill this place. We thank you for this building, this church that we get to call home, Feather Sound Church, Lord. We thank you for your family here, our family, the Feather Sound family. Lord, would you pour out a fresh anointing on our speaker today, a fresh anointing on our worship team, and a fresh anointing on all of us. Would you stir in us a heart to worship you, to give you glory and honor and praise that you so deserve? Would you teach us, Lord, to do your will? Would you fill us with kingdom purpose, Lord? And the church cries out. Glory. glory. Praise the Lord. I want to read Psalm 100. And... Uh, says this, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with singing, with, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. And in the five verses in Psalm 100, it has an exclamation point six times. And that speaks volumes to how we are supposed to worship with an exclamation. So as we worship the Lord today, let's just worship him with everything we have. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him.
sing this next song, I just want us to think about the lyrics that we're about to sing. Part of the lyrics to this song, it says, Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you more than anything, more than anything. And I want us to reflect and think in our hearts, can we honestly say that we love Jesus more than anything? Or is there things in our lives that's taking first place? Or is there things in our life that are competing? Maybe something's a second place or too close of a second place. And I just want us to reflect deep within our hearts. And if we can't say that we love Jesus more than anything, then let's just cry out to God and say, Lord, I want to love you more than anything. Just give him something to work with, and he'll work with it. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says this, Do not love the world or, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away with, along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. In Romans 12, one, uh, verse one, it says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. And then later we find the next verse that that's how we find the will of God is, is by first offering our body as a living sacrifice. And so if you haven't done that this morning, or if you've done that, but you've strayed away, just offer it to him. Continue offering him a sacrifice of praise. So Father, Lord, would you just give us the ability, Lord, to love you more than anything, Lord, that we put to death the deeds of the flesh by your spirit. In the name of Jesus.
deserve the glory for from you are all things to you are all things you deserve the glory Jesus you deserve the glory
Lord. You guys may be seated. I think uh, I think there's a video coming up. Hey, Pastor Art here. I'm on Mount Carmel in Israel. You can see the mouth of the Jezreel Valley, which is also the opening of uh, where the Valley of Megiddo is. You see the Mediterranean Sea back there. Just we're here studying and we're teaching on 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, I'll post a video. You can see that. But I'm here doing announcements for this weekend. We got a couple of things that we want you to be aware of. First, on the 27th is the Tampa Bay Pro-Life Breakfast at 9 a.m. You can sign up at tampabayprolife.org slash events. Starts at 9 a.m. Like I said, on the 27th, they're going to discuss the all things pro-life. If you support life, come join us for that breakfast. The 29th, the youth are doing from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. They're doing a car wash. If you have supplies to donate, they would greatly appreciate or come by. They're raising money for camp. You can find out more information at feathersoundchurch.com slash events. That's the 29th. Get your car 
car wash support youth, it's a win-win. Third thing is on the 30th, Sunday, after second service, 12.30 p.m., we're doing a estate planning class. We're taking heed of what Solomon says to think about your life with the end in mind, and a lot of people aren't thinking about their estate planning a will and how to contribute and what to do with your finances after and how to love your loved ones and further the kingdom of God. And so Joel will be answering questions and going through what the Bible has to say. Pizza will be provided. That is the 30th at 1230. Lastly, May 4th, we have the National Day of Prayer. It's going to be at a local church uh, just up McMullen Booth, Countryside Christian Church, 7 p.m. I believe is the time. It'll be correct me down below if it's not, but that is the National Day of Prayer. We're joining all kinds of churches as we come together that evening to pray for our country and our county united together. Join us. We'll see you soon from Israel. Good morning, Feather Sound Church. My name is Gabe Graham. I'm one of your elders here. And it's my privilege to introduce a guest speaker this morning. We have Pastor Paul Cowley with us and his wife, Marcia. I've been praying for them for almost 20 years, probably, in my personal prayer time. And it's been awesome to see what God has decided to use them for in furthering his kingdom. As Paul comes up, we're going to familiarize you with their ministry with this video. So please enjoy. We live in an age of increasing lawlessness and anti-God society. The fruit is undeniable. Unbridled crime, poverty, oppression, and hopelessness abound. To many, it would seem as if God has forgotten about us all. It's happening all over the world. The global elite are prospering. The middle class is being dismantled, while the poor are herded into urban collectives of misery, squalid shanty towns of epic proportions. One of the most epic is found here. Continent, Africa. Region, East Africa. Most populated nation, Kenya. Most prominent city, Nairobi. Most disturbing distinction, rated as one of Africa's most violent cities. Most stunning statistic, home to one of the greatest concentrations of urban slums in the world. Nairobi contains five million residents. More than half live in slums. One of these is named Kibera, located in a valley three miles long and one mile wide with more than half a million people. It is the single largest slum in all of Africa. There are no squatters in Kibera. Everyone pays rent. For $50 a month, you and your family get a 10 foot by 10 foot room. Dirt floors, no electricity, no running water, no latrine. Kibera hosts a pandemic of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, typhoid, and hepatitis. Violent crime goes unchecked. By all practical appearances, the slum dwellers have been forsaken and abandoned. Many have said they are accursed, nothing more than human trash. But there's at least one that has a different opinion of these slum dwellers. Jesus has not abandoned the slum dwellers. His church is there and it's growing. Thanks to his shepherds who live and minister in the very heart of Gabara. Men born and raised in the slums. Men he has called to pastor and shepherd his people in places you and I cannot go. Reaching millions of people throughout Nairobi's 199 slums. These slum pastors have never been to a Bible school. Nairobi's Bible schools charge about $2,000 per year. Clearly, their doors are closed to these pastors. Despite these dire circumstances, these pastors have found hope and help at Disciple Support Ministries Bible Institute, where we reach, train, and encourage these pastors, the pastors of the least. 
Disciple Support Ministries began in the slums of Nairobi in 2002. The vision began with the hope of 25 to 30 serious, diligent, and committed pastors to attend. But the Lord had more in mind. We now operate four Bible schools and average 400 pastors and ministry leaders each semester. One in the Cabrera slum, another in Nairobi's second largest slum, the Matheri Valley, and the two new campuses in the neighboring country of Tanzania. Disciple Support Ministries provides discipling through the word, teaching indigenous pastors the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, emphasizing real life application, personal holiness, and the call to make disciples. All of the Bible teaching is done by indigenous pastors of the slums, men born and raised in the slums, teaching the people of the slums, men of God raised up through our Bible schools, teaching their own people, like these men you see here, teaching the only gospel that saves and gives life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thousands of pastors and ministry leaders have attended our free Bible schools, and there are thousands more that we need to reach. This is Paul and Marcia Cowley. They have been serving as DSM missionaries since 2002. You are their family in Christ. You are their home team. You have an opportunity to get to know them, encourage them, and help them. Pray for God's hand to protect and guide our missionaries. Pray for God's pastors, our African brothers in Christ, to continue to stand in the face of such desperate conditions. You are invited to find out more about Disciple Support Ministries. We welcome you to simply sign up for our monthly newsletter. It will bless you each month. It will let you see what God sees, and it will reveal to you His heart, His heart for the Great Commission, His heart for the pastors of the least in the slums of Africa. I know you want to dance. I'm not good at dancing, but my Brazilian wife is, so. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's open the word of prayer, please. Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to, to carve out time uninterrupted. We are devoted to you, Lord. We've come here because of you. We want to hear from you. We long to be people that are vessels of honor in your hands. We long to be changed. We pray that you'll receive our thanksgiving and praise this morning. We pray also that you will reign in our life. There are things that need to change. Each one of us has room for improvement and each one of us has been called for a holy purpose. We've been bought for a price and we've been bought for a purpose, to give you glory and honor and pleasure. May we be busy about your business. May you grant us ears to hear this morning, hearts that are soft to you, and may kingdom business be accomplished. We pray specifically, Lord, that you would anoint the ministry of your word. It is your word that does the work. And so we just submit ourselves, we put ourselves on your altar this morning. All that we have and all that we do, we put it on the altar, Lord. And now, have your way with us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, how many people here am I meeting for the first time? Anyone for the first time? 
Okay, so uh, I'll give a little background on, on the ministry um, before I go into a message. We're, we now have four Bible school locations in East Africa. Um, we minister only to pastors and ministry leaders. So the people you see in the Bible schools, all of them are people of tremendous spiritual influence in the slum communities. They're not coming to us to learn how to be a pastor or a ministry leader. They're already doing that. The challenge is that when they come to us, most of them are bringing a Jesus that you would barely recognize as a Jesus of the Bible. Many of them still engaged in witchcraft in the church, ancestral worship, animal sacrifice and rituals that are, I couldn't even describe to you, with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on top. You know, the only thing worse than not knowing Jesus is knowing the wrong one. That's the greatest deception we could be under. Some of you are shaking your heads because you've been there. I was there for 35 years, so I know what it's like. And so when they come to us, we would say that probably at least 80% of our pastors and ministry leaders are not born again. And yet, most of them have two to three churches some of them have as many as 85 churches. They're not the kind of churches that we would like to multiply. That's why we need to be very careful when we get into church planting efforts. Just because someone says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, it doesn't mean it's the same Lord that you're thinking of. There are many Jesuses out there. And so when they come to us, what we offer them is free Bible school something they can never qualify for. They don't have the education. They don't have the financial means. They don't have the recommendations. They're not getting into Bible school. We say, come to the Bible school free. In fact, the Bible school is in your slum. We put them in the slum deliberately so that they can access it easily, but also to make sure that we don't attract people who can pay for Bible school. Because there's plenty of Bible schools in East Africa. But these slum pastors can't get in them. So by putting it inside the slum, no one who's not from a slum will ever come in a slum in Nairobi. Not a single Kenyan will ever do that their entire life because they're considered cursed people. If you go in there, the belief is you come out with a curse. We go in there and our contribution again is a free Bible school. Their contribution is that they're missing a day of work. These are working pastors. They work full-time jobs, plus their full-time pastors, plus their full-time fathers, plus, plus, plus. A very busy, very complicated, incredibly difficult life. And so for them to come to Bible school, they're missing a day of wages, which is a huge contribution. We had expected and hoped that someday we would have 25 pastors coming. When we opened our first Bible school, we had 110 on the first day. We averaged 225 for many years. Last year, it exploded on us. We had 325 pastors coming and ministry leaders. This year, we just finished our first semester, we had 400. So God is doing a tremendous work. What they're coming for is something quite unusual. They want to know this Jesus in this book. We don't support them financially. We have no other, nothing else that we're drawing them with except this. If you want to learn the Bible, come to Disciple Support Ministries. And they're coming. All the teaching in the Bible schools are done by pastors that have been raised up through the ministry. I have not been teaching on the pulpit there for more than three years. They do all the teaching. They do all the administration. I spend about 25% of my time in Kenya, and I spend 75% of my time here in the States doing this. Now, obviously, the focus of what we're doing is inside the church. And I'm going to speak to you today about some things inside the church that we need to, t to discuss we disciple them through the word, and that's what we'll do this morning. We'll use the word of God. 
Sometimes we can read this book over and over again and miss the most simple interpretations. But we disciple them through the word and give them a passion for the word of God and then make them into disciple makers. That's the goal of what we're doing. So they'll plant the churches. They'll do the evangelism. They do all of that very, very well. We just want to make sure it's the true Jesus of this Bible. So I, I, live, I live in, uh, by the way, if you want to find out more about the ministry, uh, we have a table in the back. Come back and pick up the newsletter. Sign up for this. We only send out hard copies. We don't send email copies because you don't read your emails. I know that. So this will sit on your coffee table for a few weeks, but eventually one morning you'll pick it up and read it. This is a ministry to you. This is not a fundraiser. This is going to be a story that will bless you. It will encourage you. It might challenge you, but I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you're watching online, you can go to disciplesupport.org and sign up online. Uh, pick up the refrigerator card. I know you go to the refrigerator. Um, put this on your refrigerator when you see us. Pray for us. Pick up the uh, bookmarker. Put it in your Bible and pray for our pastors. We need all the prayer that we can get. The enemy does not like what we're doing at all. So I, I, live in, I live in two very different worlds. Um, in East Africa, I live amongst and minister amongst people who have never been able to affect their circumstances of life. Not materially, not physically, not financially. They are stuck inside a system. It is, it is engineered poverty and depravity. And it will exist and it will not change until Jesus comes back. Those slums are not going away. Now, we can look at that as a problem or we can look at that as an opportunity. For us, it's a tremendous opportunity. When God has gathered together, all these people are gathered together in a slum... You can send over one person like me, one family, and we can impact hundreds of thousands of people because they're already gathered together, as opposed to sending many people like me out to remote parts to plant one church. We don't need to plant that church. They'll plant the church. And so in those slums, you can leave anytime you want. You can walk out. In fact, they walk out to work every day. But there's nowhere else to go to live because you've come from up country where the poverty is even worse. It's a different kind of poverty. They've come to the city, hopefully, to find a job. Hopefully, their children will learn to read and write. Hopefully, they'll find some medical care. And they get stuck in a slum. And if you don't want to stay there, all you can do is go back to what you came from. So this is happening all over the world. We call it the urbanization of the poor. They cannot change the system. They cannot affect it. Now, I also live in our culture here amongst people who have always been able to affect their circumstances, physically, financially, materially. We live in a society where if you play by the rules and you do things right, you'll move up at least a little bit. And then your children will move up a little bit more. That never will happen there. You'll be born there, you'll live there, you'll die there. Now the key point is this. Those two worlds are now converging. The ability for you to affect your circumstances is rapidly and deliberately being torn out of your hands. And things to come point to a time of trouble such as we've never had. Time is short, and the enemy of your soul knows it. And his foot is down on the accelerator, in case you haven't noticed. Things are moving very, very fast. Now, the pastors in the slums, they understand this. They understand things to come are going to be catastrophic, and these are things not years from now. These are things months from now and even weeks from now. You're shocked, going to be shocked what's going to happen. 
And they also have their foot on the accelerator because they understand time is short and we're to be busy about the Lord's business. They're preparing themselves all the more earnestly for what's coming. My question is, how about you? If you could, please turn with your Bible to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And then I'll also be in Colossians chapter 3. Luke chapter 12 and Colossians chapter 3. Jesus is speaking and he says this in Luke chapter 12. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them saying this, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, if we were examining those verses in the Bible school, we would use a very basic inductive Bible study technique. We would begin underlining what is repeating in order to find the theme. What is repeating here? I, me, my. A very self-directed man, very sure of himself, very wise unto himself. The point is that this man, so self-assured, was completely, utterly unprepared for the circumstances coming ahead. The critical day ahead had nothing to do with things. Neither an abundance of things nor a lack of things. He was utterly unprepared and the focus of his past and present actions were completely in the wrong direction. Laying up things, preparing things himself for his future according to his view of reality. Now, I speculate that this man thought himself to be quite wise and prudent and forward-thinking. And yet, God calls him a fool. Let's continue in verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, so here's the conclusion. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God, 
If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the ovens, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not, do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But, here's the contrast, seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Do not fear. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, before I get to the next verse, please put your seatbelt on. Verse 33. Sell what you have and give alms. Now, let me pause for a moment. That's a very, very powerful verse. It's as if God is saying, not only am I saying, don't you be accumulating like that. Take what you have and go sell it. As if he's saying, test me in this. Test me in this. Now that, that I, I, could, I could speak on that for hours. I'm still trying to unpack that. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what do we see? What's repeating there? Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Do not fear, five times. Do not worry, do not be anxious, do not fear what? Things. Don't be worried about things. And so Jesus has left us with, in just these few verses, four commandments. These are not suggestions. These are not things for us just to contemplate. These are commandments. He says, number one, here's the number one command. Seek the kingdom of God. Number two, do not fear things to come. Again, financially, physically material. Don't fear that. Number three, rather sell what you have and give alms. Again, a massively powerful statement. And finally, prepare spiritually for the future reality. Prepare spiritually for what's coming. Now, Jesus was using a rich man as an example, and the contrast could not be greater with the people we minister to. Our pastors and ministry leaders are not rich by any means whatsoever. In fact, they're utterly, desperately destitute, beyond description. Um, to talk about the word abundance amongst them is utter nonsense, if not insulting. They have no abundance they have lived a life of deprivation. There is no room. There is no capacity for anything other than this. They live, they live not one day at a time. They live one moment at a time. For someone like me to go over there and, and lecture them with a seminar on estate planning or financial peace or financial prosperity is utterly insulting the key point is this if anyone was living on the edge and could justify fear of things to come it would be them and yet and yet they're spending their time in spiritual things 
coming to the Bible school and missing a day of work. When someone lives hand to mouth, if you don't work today, you don't eat today, literally. That's not a hyperbole, that's the way it is. Not only are they not working that day, most of them are spending some kind of money on bus fare to get to the Bible school. So they're actually in a deficit. Missing a day of work, spending money on transport, in the midst of a crisis, going to Bible school while the world around them is disintegrating, and tragedy knocks on their door every day. And what are they doing? They're building themselves up spiritually for the very real circumstances and crisis that is coming. They have a different perspective. What is their perspective? Turn with me, would, if you could, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Again, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, it might read different from yours if you have the wrong Bible. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's their perspective. They believe that and they live that. key point is that for a Christian, and I'm assuming everyone in this room is a Christian, if you're not a Christian, now is the time to get in the ark. The raindrops are coming already. I'm assuming everyone in this room is a Christian, and for a Christian, anxiety about things on this earth indicates a severe spiritual departure from the faith. When I say severe spiritual departure, that's just a euphemism for sin. It misses the mark. I had mentioned to you earlier that uh, you can get connected to this newsletter. Uh, I brought one today called A Day in the Life. This is just a brief thousand words to give you a snapshot view of a real pastor, what a typical pastor that we serve, what their life is like each day. Now, I'm gonna tell you, if you're already getting the newsletter, you probably never saw this one, pick this one up. When you read it, make sure you're sitting down because you're gonna fall out of your chair. It will shock you, it will shock you. But I want you to understand this, as you read about this man's difficult life beyond description, the destitution, the frustration, the injustice, the corruption. Understand this, that's not the point. The point is that in the midst of that, he's seeking things of God. And if he can do it, you can do it. We are understanding again these pastors and ministry leaders come to Bible school one day a week. Some of them only half a day a week. Why? Again, because they're working full-time jobs. We get to see them one day a week at tremendous cost to them. But we get to see them at least for two years to get through the program. Most of them take three years. We get to know them very, very well. 
the slow drip of discipleship through the word of God. That's what they feel like they need to get through life. How about you? Again, these are people who have always understood that they cannot affect their physical, material, financial conditions. It's amazing in this world that some fools still think they can. My friend, those days are over. They're done. It was about 22 years ago that I found myself in Nairobi teaching, teaching the Bible on the radio program. I want you to understand Nairobi doesn't look just like that. In fact, Nairobi is one of the most developed cities in Africa. A very expensive city. We have 16 lane super highways. We have a first class airport. We have five star hotels. And I will see more Mercedes Benz in one day than you see in a year. When you see slums in a city, that's not a poor city, that's an expensive city. Think Hong Kong, think Mexico City, think Rio de Janeiro, think Manila. These are very, very, very expensive places. So you have two extremes to society. So I was downtown in a big high-rise building, air-conditioned, sitting in a cushy chair at a radio station teaching Jesus. And I thought I was doing something for Christ. And one night I came down this elevator, the doors opened up, and there were six men. They said to me, are you Brother Paul? And I said, why? You see, that's the right answer to give in Nairobi. Why? Well, well you, you may not know this, but we've been, we, the pastors in the slums, been listening to this program, and, and we've never heard anything like this. We needed to come and meet you. Will you please come down and meet us? Well, well that's actually not a very... Um, small thing to request. Going into a slum in, in Nairobi is not something you do casually. In fact, as I said before, if you're a Kenyan and you're not from a slum, you will never ever in a lifetime walk in a slum because they're cursed people according to their culture. They're also very dangerous places. So I prayed and of course, Jesus said, of course you're going. So I, I, I went, you know. Um, and, and as you might notice on the video, I don't exactly like just blend in. Like you probably could see me on there, right? So there I am in the midst of all these people and, and, and the 25 pastors there meeting me and said, you know, we've had people like you coming here for 150 years. We really don't need another one. However, if you would do ministry the way that we need it, we would like you to stay. Now, I'm thinking, well, what do they need? I'm looking around. Again, coming from a task-oriented culture, I'm thinking, well, first thing we need to do is clean this place up. It looks like a, it looks like a slum. <laughs> you know, there's no right angles. I'm used to right angles. Um, and there's no straight road. Everything, you know, it's like my... my, my Obsessive compulsive part came out and said, I can't deal with this anymore. Let's fix it. What do you need? And I'm ready to write down a list of what, what to bring, what to do. And they said, well, first thing we need you to do is don't ever give us money. Don't ever give us money. We need to be working. Your money has made us lazy. Don't bring us anything. Don't give us anything. Don't even give us Bibles. You give us Bibles, we turn around, we sell them on the market. Don't dig us wells. Don't build churches for us. Don't give us your WWJD bracelets. Don't give us anything because we are fighting for your things. We don't have the moral character to handle your things. We become thieves and covetous. This is what we need. What you're doing on that radio program, give us that and nothing else. Now, I was utterly, utterly shocked. It changed the entire course of my life. And that's what we do. And that's what they wanted. 
again, they come to Bible school, they don't get anything. They get a desk. If they pass one semester and they're faithful, we then give them a Bible, but they've earned it. And only so that we have the same version to read from. And every time they come to Bible school, they have duties. They clean the Bible school. They set up the Bible school. We have what we call mandatory volunteering. If you have children, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> mandatory volunteering. So there's a list of 50 students every week volu volunteering to do everything. They're coming because of this. They want to meet the real Jesus. They want to be prepared for life. You know, I, I, I want you to know that giving is a good thing, but there's a very real accountability for that. I want you to understand the warning. We are never to be giving prayerlessly and carelessly. Before you give, make sure you pray every time. There's also a very real accountability for accumulating. Before you accumulate anything, make sure you don't do that carelessly and prayerlessly because we're going to be judged for that. Let me bring this to a close. I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Verse 4. Jesus, is, Jesus is, is speaking. Luke chapter 12 verse 4. And he says this. And I say to you my friends. I say to you my friends. Do not be afraid. Of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear God. Who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear God. Now, verse, the next verse, he immediately balances this against something material, financial. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? He's indicating something that is virtually worthless in the world, and he says, yet, not one of them is forgotten by God. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. My friend, if we just had the faith of a sparrow, unfortunately, we have misplaced fear. We have replaced fear of God with a fear of of a lack of things, physical, material, and financial. If you remember back in the 1930s and 40s, there was millions of human beings, people, living human beings, being herded into boxcars and sent off to concentration camps most of them were Jews. And they were headed like us to a destination not of their choosing that they couldn't control. They were told it was a good place, everything was going to be wonderful, a utopia. But they had heard rumors that it might not be. But one thing was for sure, they were on a path that they could not stop. 
And as they were herded onto the boxcars, they were told they could take one piece of luggage per family. Put in it whatever you want, get on the car. What did they put in the luggage? They put in physical, material, financial things. Stuffed to the brim for the destination ahead. Into the cars they want, the doors were shut, standing room only, you couldn't even squat. They stood for two to three days in utter darkness. I can only imagine what they were thinking. Most were probably thinking about their luggage. Oh, what I should have put in. Oh, I forgot this. I wish I had more of that. But there was a few, there were a few who weren't thinking about their luggage. They were praying to Jehovah. Now let me ask you, when those doors opened up, who was prepared for what was going to come? So my question remains, how are you preparing for things to come? Because they're coming. The pastors that we serve, I know how they're preparing. I just was over there, I got back just a few weeks ago from the end of our first semester and I was pulled aside three different times by bishops and senior pastors He's coming and saying, Brother Paul, we have a great need. Yes, what is it? We need you to put a Bible school in our slum. We have the land, we have the building, we have the people. Please just send us a teacher. That's how they're preparing. If I built five Bible schools tomorrow, I'd fill them tomorrow night. Now, how about here? How are people preparing? Well, some people have what I would call the bunker mentality. You know, the preppers. Storing up food and patriot packs and guns and ammo and satellite phones and little solar panels so they can live in some organic off-the-grid paradise up in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, pull up the drawbridge, fill the moat. We're going to ride it out, Bessie. Stocking up. Just like the rich man in the parable. calling it and justifying it, justifying it as an abundance of caution. You know, we can use the Bible to justify almost anything, including sin. We can go to the book of Proverbs and you can give me 15 verses on being prepared materially for the future. But that's not the point today. To say we're being wise as servants and good stewards and yet we're violating the very lesson that Jesus has given us. As for me and my house, we're going to be busy about his business. Seeking first and foremost things of the kingdom of God and studying. Studying his word, not the stock market tomorrow morning. And making things, making disciples, not making bunker preparations. We can't have it both ways. And in the middle is the worst spot to be. As for me and my house, we'll be numbering 
numbering our days, not our assets, and preparing, preparing my spirit for the catastrophic times that are coming. Preparing myself for my judgment before the king of kings so that I might not appear before him empty-handed. And refusing. We refuse to worry because anxiety for a Christian is nothing less than sin. It is blasphemous against the very character of our Father. And it's defiant against the very commandments we just read. If you remember back to the day of your salvation, that day when you heard the gospel again and the Holy Spirit moved in such a powerful way that you surrendered your life to Christ and gave him everything because you are probably thinking about your death and realized, I'm not prepared to meet my maker. That's a good thing. But I want to remind you this. It's not enough to give Jesus your death. You have to give him your life, one moment at a time. It's not a one-time transaction. Let me close just by saying, things are coming. And it's much worse than you might be thinking. Don't believe what you're seeing on the news. It's worse than that. In fact, I would suggest to you, turn off. Turn off the nonsense and the propaganda. And listen to words of life. Things are coming of truly biblical proportions. Things on this earth that will have eternal significance forever. And we must be, we must be spiritually prepared to face the practical crisis. We need to be prepared like my friends, the pastors of the least. Let me close in prayer. Please, I would invite you again. Feel free to come back and connect with us and Sign up for a newsletter. If you're watching online, you can get it at disciplesupport.org. We would love for you to be connected. Uh, we would like to have this minister to you and have you praying for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the ministry of your word and we pray that what is of your Holy Spirit would be retained and what is from a man and from the flesh would be discarded and forgotten. Lord, the things that you've told us are not hard things, they're beautiful things. You want your people to be set free. You don't want us under the yoke of the enemy or of this world. You've called us out to another kingdom and another king. We spend so many hours a week, Lord, looking at what the world's doing. The world will not be our judge. You will be our judge. Forgive us for being distracted and deceived. Forgive us for being wise in our own eyes. You say that only a fool is wise in his own eyes. We confess. We repent. We invite you. We beg you to forgive, to help, to deliver us. These are ties that bind, Lord, to our very flesh. 
the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life has crept in and it's pushed out your light. It's made our salt tasteless and our light has been dimmed. And you've called us to life of abundance. God forbid we've taken that to mean material things. Lord, I think of our dear friends that we serve, that you've given us the privilege to serve. And every time I'm with them, I realize how destitute I am and how rich they are. I long, Lord, for all of us and for this nation and this culture to turn back to you, but it must begin in the church and it must begin one moment at a time. Grant us courage, Lord. You say there's no room for cowards in your kingdom. Grant us courage to make those decisions that need to be made, to have the uncomfortable conversations and even the confrontations in our marriages and in our families, at the workplace and in our communities. Let us be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Let our witness be pure and may you, God, in your mercy, in your mercy, prepare us for things to come. For you are our Father, there's nowhere else we can turn. And we pray this in your name, Jesus, and according to your will, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. God bless you.